In dogs, leptospira tends to cause a more severe disease in younger animals. Interestingly, severity is not correlated with serovar, so serovar is varied geographically, and we can see severe or mild disease associated with uh, any particular serovar. Clinical signs in affected animals include pyrexia, vomiting, dehydration, and diarrhea, including melina. So this is when we have digested blood in the feces and it has a black and tarry appearance. Peripheral vascular collapse, tachypnea, poor capillary perfusion. So all of these are, are suggesting a very severe systemic disease. Icterus, so in these animals, the liver is also damaged and that can result in heightened bilirubin concentrations. In per acute infections, we can see a massive leptospiremia and rapid death, so sudden death is also possible. And we tend to see leptospira more commonly in hounds and working dogs. So presumably these are animals that have more contact with wildlife or with contaminated water sources. In these images here, we can see icterus in um, various anatomical locations of the dog. So in panel A, we have yellowing of the gingiva, in B, we have a yellowed sclera. And then in C, on postmortem, you can see yellowing of that intra-abdominal fat, all classical for icterus. Just like in pigs, we associate leptospira infections in dogs with tubulointerstitial nephritis. Um, you can see that on cut section here. And on the right, I think you can also maybe appreciate some renal cortical hemorrhagic lesions, so these darkened uh, red spots in the renal cortex. This image here is from uh, IDEX, uh, a large commercial diagnostic lab which operates in both Canada and the United States. And what they've reported here is the percentage of positive tests um, by microscopic agglutination tests, so the MAT test, done all over the US. And what I want you to appreciate here is just the regions of the United States which have at least the highest test positivity rates. So. California and the West Coast, and then sort of around the Great Lakes region and Northeastern United States are probably our hotspots. Here in Canada, a similar study was recently published. Here we can see the number of uh, PCR positive tests across the country. So nationally, you can see these areas with sort of the peach color, there were zero positive tests. So here in Saskatchewan and Manitoba, it would be a very, very low number, if any at all. And this map also highlights some of the more hot spots. So on the West Coast in Victoria, British Columbia, and also the greater Vancouver area, as well as Southern Ontario, where you can see a much higher number of positive tests around the greater Toronto area. And then as well on the East Coast around Halifax um, and the Southern Maritimes. These are the regions where at least at present, you would be most likely to see leptospira. Treatment in dogs really depends on the severity of disease. Um, so supportive therapy is very, very important, fluids, et cetera. Antimicrobials are also critical. So penicillin is the treatment of choice for acute disease. And then tetracyclines, macrolides, or aminoglycosides are needed to eliminate the carrier state. Vaccines are certainly available. And while they're able to prevent clinical disease, they don't provide great protection against the carrier state. So they don't reduce the zoonotic risk associated with canine leptospira. Really, your best control measure is to avoid um, contact with potential reservoirs, so whether that's contaminated water uh, or wildlife reservoirs of disease like rats. In people, um, leptospira can present as an acute onset fever, headache, muscle pain, and conjunctivitis. And this can actually mimic dengue fever. So this is a viral infection, which is uh, present in tropical countries. And that's an important differential diagnosis because of where leptospira is most common. These are also dengue endemic regions. We can also see icterus in infected people, so 5 to 10% of cases. And there's potentially quite a high case fatality rate. So 1 to 5% of people who aren't treated can die. And up to 20% of people if they have hepatorenal failure without dialysis. So serious organ dysfunction um, requires really aggressive therapy. Occupational exposure is frequently implicated in human disease. So workers on farms, mines, sewers, abattoirs, veterinarians, people working with fish, dairy, and the military. So all people who are going to be in contact with potentially wet environments. 
There's also an association with uh, recreational contact with contaminated water, so swimming, wading, rafting. And of course, these are much more common and much more likely in tropical climates. Infection is oftentimes acquired by contact with either the skin or mucous membranes with this contaminated water, soil, vegetation, or potentially even urine. Um, the disease has an incubation period of approximately 10 days from initial exposure. And it's a disease that's really important. So globally, there are over a million cases a year, resulting in 60,000 deaths. In North America, it's relatively rare in people. It's estimated that there's one to 200 cases of leptospirosis in people annually in the United States. In Canada, we don't have such great data. Um, so like I said, it's not a nationally notifiable disease, and so we lack good statistics. However, um, there is some data from the province of Alberta um, between 1983 and 2004, only one case was identified. And the BC CDC reports that as of 2008, only two cases had ever been reported to them. So very infrequent, um, at least in Canada. Travel associated infections are really important. And I would encourage anyone who is either living in an endemic country or planning to travel to an endemic country or highly endemic country to check out this resource from the US Centers for Disease Control. Um, critical uh, uh, prevention measures include hand hygiene, so washing your hands, avoiding animals or contact with animals. And it may also be worth discussing antimicrobial prophylaxis at a travel clinic. So bringing doxycycline, particularly if you're going to be traveling um, during a period of high rainfall. Urban leptospirosis in developing countries oftentimes follows the monsoon season. So we have flooded urban areas, which may have rats in them as well. Those rats pee into the water, which then allows the organism to disseminate and potentially contact um, people who, who get wet. We have no vaccine licensed for uh, preventing leptospira in people here in Canada, so we really rely on avoidance. Sample collection and handling will really depend on the stage of disease that your patient is at, and we'll talk about this more in a few slides. So whole blood, urine can certainly be very useful. Remember, we want to collect a midstream urine um, or preferably a cystocentesis. We can preserve the cellular morphology of the leptospira that are present with formalin. We can also send in tissue samples. So if we have an animal which has died um, of the kidney and liver, this organism can remain alive for several days if not frozen. Um, so culture is certainly possible if that's available at your local diagnostic lab. Otherwise, formal fixation can allow histological evaluation. In cases of abort abortion, um, abortuses or placental tissues can be useful. Um, whenever collecting these samples, personal protective equipment should be used to avoid contact with the animals. Um, so think about this in terms of having a dog who's hospitalized with leptospira um, in your clinic. You want to make sure that yourself and your staff are not coming into contact with urine. This organism can be identified in a number of ways. Uh, we can detect the organism live uh, in fresh urine by dark field microscopy, and I'll show you a picture of that in the next slide. We can do PCR on urine. We can do serological testing. So this is that MAT test, the microscopic agglutination test. And this involves mixing patient sera with leptospira cultures and then looking for agglutination. So antibodies in your patient serum, which are able to bind up uh, reference cultures. We can also isolate this organism from the blood early in infection. Um, remember, culture is difficult. It requires specialized media, potentially long incubation times, etc. cetera. Um, once we have the positive culture, we then uh, identify the organism using molecular methods, and we can use fluorescent antibodies on tissues collected at necropsy, so the liver and kidney. In this image here, you can see uh, dark field microscopy uh, with Leptospira Borg Petersoni. This is a really useful test for identifying live organisms in freshly collected urine. You're going to see them motile, and they'll really stand out uh, quite nicely. So we have dark field microscopy, as we just saw. We have culture. We have the MAT test, that microscopic agglutination test. Uh, we have rapid diagnostics. We have histopathology, and we have PCR-based assays. So with all of these tests available, um, how do you select the one that's best for your patient? Well, first of all, we have to consider the sort of advantages and disadvantages of each test. 
um, and the availability of um, each assay with the diagnostic labs we use. Culture, for instance, may not be available. The other thing that we need to consider is what stage of disease is your patient at? So this is a figure which details sort of the time course of Leptospira infections and how this relates to diagnostics. So very early in the disease, for instance, we may see organisms in the blood, in which case blood cultures and PCR of the blood uh, is a, a possibility. Later on, uh, we see the organism shed into urine. Um, we'll see uh, urine cultures and urine PCRs being positive. And we also get uh, the development of an anamnestic response, so antibodies in the blood, and we can start to see uh, positive reactions for the microscopic agglutination test. So the decision of which test to select is partially based on when in the course of disease you think your patient is. So it's important to know about the biology of your pathogen and your host's response to that pathogen. When is each analyte going to turn up positive? When it comes to interspecies transmission, this is very, very important for leptospira. Whether it's between an animal and an animal, or an animal and a human, all are well recognized. These organisms have a very broad host range, including wild and domestic mammals, reptiles, and amphibians. Um, and we know that they're widely spread. So there was a study in 1983 which tested uh, rats in Detroit, Michigan, and found that 90% of them were positive for Leptospira ictrohemorrhagia. In Europe, we know that the hedgehog is an important reservoir of Leptospira. Um, and so again, whenever you're dealing with animals that you think may be positive, personal protective equipment is really important to prevent contamination of yourself and, and prevent these infections. This was a case report that I thought was really interesting of a waterborne outbreak of leptospirosis in Italy. Um, there were a number of cases. So in uh, July 1984, 33 cases were identified serologically, um, including a number of people who actually died. And what turned out to be the source of these infections was actually a hedgehog that was found dead at the bottom of a well. So likely it was shedding this organism into the environment, into the water, it was leaching from the dead animal into the water, uh, which was then uh, consumed, resulting in human infections. So waterborne transmission, really, really important with lepto. There's a variety of treatment options that are available. Um, you need to be aware of what species you're treating, so what animal species, uh, what serovar of leptospira is in that animal, and is it a host-adapted strain, and what the withdrawal times may be. So particularly with agricultural animals, we always have to be aware of violative food residues. You also have to think about what is your goal for treatment. Are you trying to cure the animal clinically or actually eliminate a carrier status? Two drugs which are not recommended are chloramphenicol um, and the sulfonamides. These have been shown to be not effective uh, for treating leptospira. We have just a couple of new terms today, and of course, a few questions for self-assessment.